So this summer, this summer, 71 million people will go on a road trip in the United States. How many of you guys, by show of hands, have gone on a road trip this summer already or are planning to at some point? So most people, some people, we, we are a country that loves to travel. 151 million people are going to travel somewhere, but 71 million people are going on a road trip. When I was growing up and my parents were raising support to be missionaries, we traveled everywhere all the time. It seemed like we were always in a car. We would drive to churches in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Nebraska, Missouri, Kentucky, New York. We would go all raising support to be missionaries, we were always on the road. And even this last week, on Monday morning, Mindy and I said, let's just go to Amarillo. You know, let's just go to Amarillo. When we first moved here to Clayton, Amarillo seemed so far away. It was like, oh, it's going to take forever to get there, right? But now we're to the point where it's like, oh, you know, just hop on up there and, and come back. But the, the, the thing is, as a country, we love to travel. We love road trips. And there's one book of the Bible that's almost completely set on a road trip. I'd ask you to guess, but it's behind me on the screen, so that'd be cheating. But the book of Numbers, I guarantee you that I'm one of the only people in the sanctuary right now that is excited about the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers are, is regularly voted the most boring book in the Bible. I'm not trying to be irreverent. I'm just trying to tell you what people think about this book. Right? At BibleGateway.com, it is the least read book of the Bible. But I read through it last year as I was reading through the, the beginning of Scripture, and I fell in love with this book. I sat and had my notes from it, and, and it just I, I, I cried out of pages, and I thought, there's so much here. Why, why, why do we consider this uh, the, the, the most boring book? Well, the reason why people consider it the most boring book in the Bible is because of, well, the numbers. Chapters 1 through 9 and 26 through 36 are almost entirely made up of what do you think it is? Yeah. Numbers. It's almost entirely made up of numbers, lists, laws, names, and regulations. So people tend to look at this book and they get lost in the first few chapters and they think, how many names am I going to have to read? Even in Sunday school this morning as we're reading through Joshua, we had a Joe got to the part where it was just this bunch of names and, and we're trying to figure out how to pronounce them and how to do all this. But I think people get lost in this book because it's full of numbers. But what we're, we're going to do, I promised myself, when I, when I read through this book, I promised myself, I'm going to preach on the book of Numbers, and I'm going to change your opinion of it. So that's my challenge. Well, I can't do it. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is the only one that's going to be able to do that. But that's my challenge for us, to open our eyes, open our hearts, and, and try to look at this book without the stigma that we usually attach to it. We're going to take a road trip with the people of Israel through the book of Numbers. So the original name of the book was surprisingly not Numbers. Even though it's full of numbers, it's not called Numbers. It was called the Midbar, which means in the desert or in the wilderness. This is the story. If you're trying to figure out where this, this, this book fits into the, the whole scope of Scripture, this is the story of the Israelites when they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Where were they going toward? The promised land. That's the key. Right there, I want us to stop us. Why do we sang the song this morning that, that's called, I'm going to the promised land. We said it over and over because that is the key to understanding the book of Numbers. Why would you go through something so terrible and so painful and so difficult to endure unless there was something at the end of your journey that was worth what you put into? And that's the book of Numbers. So they're going toward the promised land. The promised land is, we've kind of lost the meaning of the word, haven't we? A little bit. We've heard it since we were, since we were little. We talk about the promised land, right? The, the people of Israel, the promised land wasn't just an idea to them. It wasn't just, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get there one day. We'll, we'll get to the promised land. It was everything to them. It meant for them freedom from Egypt. It meant that they would have, would have freedom from their oppression. Do you remember when they were in Egypt in bondage? It says they cried out to the Lord. And what did he do? He heard them. He heard their prayer. He sent Moses and he rescued the people. The promised land meant freedom to them. It meant blessings to them. He had promised them. Leviticus 20, 23 says this. You will inherit the land since I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. 
He promised them this land. He said, I'll bless you there. I'll bless you like you've never been blessed before. It also represented God's answer to their prayers. They had prayed for, for freedom all this time. It also represented God's presence with his people. The promised land was everything to them. And church, this is what I want us to focus on. As we travel with the children of Israel through their journey, I want us to focus on this. God has set a promised land before us as well. I, I'm not here to teach through the book of Numbers just to fill your head with numbers. I'm not here to just give you knowledge. If you, if you knew every fact there is and you could, you could quote every verse of numbers, it wouldn't do anything for you unless you can apply it in some way to you. That's, that's, that's my job is to take what scripture says, to teach you what it said in its original context, and then to take it and apply it into our lives. God has given us and set before us a promised land. I preached on it last week. If you remember, in Romans chapter 8, we talked about how God has set before us this, this promised land. What is it? Is it health and wealth and prosperity? Is it all the, the dreams that you've ever had? Is it going to happen in this life where you just have everything that you've ever wanted? Where is our promised land? It's in heaven. God says, listen, this world that you're going to, you're going to walk through, this life that you're going to traverse, it's going to be painful. It's not going to be easy. If you think this is the promised land, then you're in for a really, really good surprise. Because this is no promised land. This is the wilderness. We, we, we wander through this wilderness of life, and sometimes people ask these questions. I've heard it over and over and over in my ministry. What's the purpose of all this? Why am I here? Why won't God just, well, if God is real, then why, why won't he just change all this? Why do we have to go through all this? And this is what scripture consistently points us to, that this page of the story that we're on is not the end. That one day God is going to remake what he has made before. The earth that was, that was destroyed by sin, he's going to remake it and we're going to reign with him on high in heaven. That is our promised land. You cannot make it through this life without a destination in mind. There's a lot of people, I think, who get saved, who get baptized, like, like these kids did today. But then they're not aiming themselves at it. I'm not talking about you guys, I'm just using you as an example. There's a lot of Christians I've known who have walked with the Lord for 20 years and who have walked in big giant circles in the wilderness because they haven't aimed themselves at something. The people of Israel knew what their destination was. They didn't know how they were going to get there. It took them a long time to get there. And we're going to talk about why. But the thing is, I want us to stop and I want us to focus on what really matters. Sometimes we focus on the things that are so unimportant. Sometimes we put all our energy and all our focus into things that mean nothing. And God says this in Colossians 3.1. I put it on the screen for you. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is where we put our focus. We say, Lord, one day you're going to come back and you're going to rescue us. And we're going to be in heaven with you. In 1868... Uh, uh, a poet named Sanford Bennett described heaven as the land that is fairer than day. That is one of my favorite lines in any song. It's so, it's so perfect. The land that's fairer than day. And how about this one, guys? Gandalf and the Lord of the Rings. Try it over here, okay? He described heaven as a far green country under a swift sunrise. Isn't that beautiful sounding? We're going to walk with the children of Israel through their journey through the wilderness. They're going toward their promised land. We're going to go toward our promise. Why don't we pray? And, uh, and we'll jump into this this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you all the praise and all the thanks. You are so good to us. And you are so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to baptize these three awesome boys, Lord. Thank you that you're making a difference in this church. Thank you that you're making a difference in this community, Lord. We cannot do this without you. We saying, Lord, I need you every single hour. I need you. I can't do this. Lord, I can't preach this sermon. Numbers is boring without you. God, I, I, I need you. I, I, can't, I can't do this. I can't pastor this church. I can't do this without your Holy Spirit. So we ask you, Lord, to fall down powerfully on us today. Lord, I ask you to move in us, to open our eyes, to get us excited about your word, to open our hearts and set them on fire, Lord, to give us a passion for who you are and how you move and how you guide us in our lives. Lord, let this not just be another Sunday. 
Lord, let it be a day where we stop and we realize heaven is on my horizon and I will do everything I can, Lord, to, to reach those reach those pearly gates with confidence in you. Lord, I can't reach heaven on my own. I can't do anything to earn it. I can't do anything to, to, to make you invite me there. But out of your grace and out of your mercy, you look at a sinner like me. And you say, Lord, and I pray that we would keep that in focus, that we would set our hearts on things above where Christ is. Lord, open up the book of Numbers to us. In your name. So let's get ready to go on this road trip together. And I, and I especially love this because in about 20 minutes or so, we're going to be packing up and going on our own little road trip to Falls Creek. So pray for uh, me and Mindy and Cassie and Chloe and Riker this afternoon as we drive up there. Let's go to the book of Numbers and we're going to start where else? At the first verse, the first chapter. Why don't we do that? We're going to read it together. So why don't you stand? Give honor to God's word. The words, if you don't have a copy of God's word in front of you, the words will be on the screen. This is Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the wilderness of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after Israel's departure from the land of Egypt. Take a census of the entire Israelite community by their clans and their father's families counting the names of every male one by one. You and Aaron are to register those who are 20 years old or more by their military divisions, everyone who can serve in Israel's home. Okay, you can be seated. And I know you're thinking, why on earth did you read that? Like what? I thought you said you were going to go through stories. I don't, I don't understand this. we got to have to understand something, okay, before we dive into this. Numbers 1 through 9 and 26 through 36 are full of numbers. Sandwiched between those are full of some of the most powerful dynamic stories in all of Scripture. But here's the point of this morning. You've got to pack the car before you leave on the trip. Right? In your house, who is the designated packer? Is there somebody better at packing than, than somebody else? I don't know in our house. Yeah, maybe. Okay, well, I do know. I don't know. I'm, I'm terrible at it. I leave everything to the last second. Mindy and Chloe were packing this week, like early in the week, like Wednesday. And we're leaving Sunday, and she said, when are you going to pack? And I said, I'll probably Sunday morning. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just closed. But here's the thing. You, you don't set out on a journey before you, before you think through, what am I going to need when I get there? How long is it going to take me to get there? What's the weather going to be like? Does anybody do that? Check the, check the weather of the place that you're going to. I do not enjoy checking the weather of Davis, Oklahoma, where Falls Creek is. Because yesterday was 95 degrees and 90% humidity. That is, oh, okay, that's why I stay in the cabin the majority of the time. But here's the thing, you don't, you don't leave on a trip without packing. And this is exactly what God is doing for his people. He's packing their car. He's getting them ready. He's provisioning them for the journey. What he's doing is doing a head count of all the people. I, I, I think of it like this. Did you ever see the movie Home Alone? Movie when, when I was a kid, we home alone. And when they're counting to make sure everybody's there on the morning they leave for Paris, their neighbor kid somehow gets in the van and he's checking in the duffel bag, and they count him as one of the people in the family. And so obviously, what happens is when they leave, the neighbor kid leaves, and Kevin is left home alone. Right? I love that movie, and I love this because this is what God's doing. He's saying, count the people, number the people, make sure everybody is here, make sure they know where they're supposed to be, give them their duties, give them their responsibilities this car. That's what he's talking through in these chapters. So that's why I read this, uh, this section. So as 71 million people get ready to go on a road trip this summer, 75% of them will forget to pack something. This is, this is me to a T. I am so panicked every time I go on a trip because I think I'm going to forget something. I'm packing and I'm not even started yet. I think I'm already going to forget something. I haven't even started packing, but I'm going to forget something. What do you think the most common thing that people forget is? Okay. Okay, you, you almost got them all. The number one thing is a phone charger. That's the number one thing people forget. Number two is either toothpaste or a toothbrush. And number three is a hairbrush. So people, we're, we're prone to forget. We forget things. My dad always made us, when we stayed at a hotel, when we were traveling, he always made the kids get down on the ground, lift up the sheets, and look under the bed, see if anything had, and we're always like, Dad, what is going to get under the bed? 
and then we look and be like, oh wait, your wallet's down here, or, or something crazy. So God's saying, listen, you guys need to be ready for this trip. He alone knows at this point that this trip is going to take them 40 years. This trip, I want, you, I want you to see this, this trip. And this is why, before I forget, this is why. We're going to read this later in Numbers 32, 13. But it says this, the Lord's anger burned against Israel. And he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the whole generation that had done what was evil in the Lord's sight was gone. But at this point, he alone knows that they're going to be wandering for 40 years. The Israelites think that this is going to be a very short trip. And as we grew up, as I grew up hearing these stories about the Israelites wandering for 40 years, how big do you think that desert really is? When I was a kid, I thought, if they're wandering for 40 years, this must be the biggest desert on the planet. This must be bigger than the Sahara. How do you get lost for 40 years? Well, the truth is they weren't really lost, right? The Lord was guiding them and cleansing them throughout this entire life. The distance from Goshen in Egypt to Jericho, the first place that they encountered in, in, the, in the promised land, is about the distance from Tukumkari to Gaza, About 300 miles, give or take a few miles. How long would it take you to drive 300 miles? Now granted, we can go 75 miles an hour, or be honest, 80, and, and, and make it there quick. The people, it should have only taken them two or three weeks to make it from Egypt to the promised land. Think of this, two to three weeks, 21 days, somewhere around there. And how long did it take them? 40 years. It was the people's sin that kept them wandering, but it was God's power and provision that kept it alive during this time. Here's an interesting fact. If each, of the, if each of the Israelites would have stood shoulder to shoulder, they would have stretched from Egypt to the Promised Land and back twice. But instead they wandered in big circles. And we're going to go through their journey here in the book of Numbers. But here's the thing. Our God is a God of detail. He doesn't leave anything out. He doesn't leave anything behind. He has never forgotten his toothbrush on the trip. Uh, that was just a dumb thing. I don't know why I said things like that, but I mean, they always looks at me and she's like, get back to the point here. The point is, is important. God is a God of details. He prepared his people for this trip. In the same way, he prepares you and I for the trip of faith that we take from the moment we accept Christ as our Savior to the moment we reach glory. God never leaves us alone. He never leaves us to our own devices. Sometimes we go through this life and we think, I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm just going day by day. I, I can't, I can't, I don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. I don't know what, what decisions I need to make. When the thing is, God has provided us with tools and with people in our lives to take us where we need to go. And I need to say this, one of the things, the people of Israel couldn't have made it to the promised land one by one. They couldn't have made it by themselves. So why on earth do we think in our faith that we can make it by ourselves without the church? I, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, I can worship anywhere. I don't need to worship in the church. I can worship on a fishing boat. I can worship out anywhere. And that's true. That is true. You can worship the Lord. All of creation cries out the Lord's name and it proves who he is. But God created the church for a purpose. He created the church for a purpose so that we can come together as one body, as one family, and make it on this road trip together. If you leave the protection and the safety and, and the provision of our family, I don't, I don't know how far you're going to make it. And I, and I hate to see that. I hate to see that 75% of our teenagers in churches leave church after they graduate and they never come back. Church, we've got to gather around these kids. We've got to gather around them. We've got to gather together as a family. That's the only way we're going to make it to the promised land. So, let's set out on this road trip if you like. Are you going to start this thing at any time? This is all introduction and I'm almost done. But here's the thing. I mean, this was just an introduction to the book. I really wanted to dip my toes in the water of numbers. Actually, lack of water. There's not going to be a lot of water in the desert. But... But I wanted us to just to get a glimpse of what this book is about and why we're going to study through it. Three things, really briefly, three things I wanted you to see. God provided three things for his people from the wilderness every single day, every step of the way. And I'm going to argue that he provides these three things for us as well. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. As we make our way through our faith journey. Number one is this, his guiding presence. 
his guiding presence. Exodus chapter 40, verse 36 says this. The Israelites set out whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle throughout all the stages of their journey. If the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel throughout all the stages of their journey. So this cloud that led them, what was it? Was it just a natural phenomenon that it just happened to come down around the people around this time? What was the cloud? It was God. It was God's presence. It was God's presence with his people. Listen to this. As they traversed through this desert, through this wilderness, every single step of the way, they could look and they could see the presence of God. I, I, I can't wrap my head around this because we live in a world today where we can't see God. And did you know that's the number one reason why people don't believe in God? Show him to me. Prove him to me. I want to see him. These people, they saw him. They saw the glory of the Lord in the cloud. And then at night, the fire of the Lord went to this cloud. He never left them. They never got lost. Any step of the way that they were right, you know, sometimes when you get out into the middle of nowhere around here, your GPS will say, recalculating, and then it can't find the signal. And for me, with the worst sense of direction in the world, that's a terrifying kind of moment because I don't know where I'm going. But the people of Israel, all they had to do if they needed to know where the Lord was, was look up. Oh, there he is. Okay. I got lost for a second, but there's the cloud. That he never left them, and he promises you the same thing. He promises in Proverbs 16, 9, a person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. The Lord's with you every single step of the way. He said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, that there is not a time, there will not be a time from when he lived on this world till the very end of this world that he will be. He said, I'll be with you every single day. You, you won't be able to flee from me. Psalm 139, I love it. It says, you, you can't go anywhere where the Lord's not there. If you go to the highest mountain, and he's there. If you go to the lowest part of the ocean, he's there. The Lord's presence guides us. But so often we think we're going to make this on our own. We think, well, uh, you know, church isn't really my thing, so I'm just going to kind of figure this out on my own. We, won't. we need his guiding presence. Number two, we see this, his hand of protection. His hand of protection. So his presence and his protection. Judges 18.6 says, The Lord is watching over the journey that you're going on. Isn't that a comforting verse? The Lord is watching over the journey that you're going on. He never, he never sets his eyes aside. He never glances over. He never, he, he never looks away from you. His, his eyes are on your journey. Your journey toward heaven, toward your promised land. He always knows where you are. He always knows where you need to be. His guiding presence, his hand of protection. When the Israelites left Egypt and the Egyptian army came back to recapture them, what did God do? He wiped them out. I love these stories. These, these, these are just awesome stories. So we're going to get into some of the book of Numbers. But he closed the sea, the Red Sea, around the, the, the people of Egypt and, and utterly crushed them. They faced uh, kings Og and Bashan in the desert. And what did God do to them? Same answer. He wiped them out. He utterly crushed them. Every single step of the way, they get to the promised land. And the first place that they meet is Jericho, a city that could not be beaten. It couldn't be, the, the walls couldn't be scaled. It couldn't be knocked down. Nothing could defeat this town. What did the Lord do? He pulled those walls down. We read it last week in church in, in, uh, in Sunday school. And it says the walls fell flat. They fell flat. The Lord protected them every single step of the way. And listen to this, 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil. There's not a day on your journey with the Lord where, you, where he's not standing around you, protecting you. The book of Psalms says that he's a shield to us. That, that he stands behind us and before us and around us. That he guards and protects. That he's a strong tower. There's nothing that's going to befall you that he didn't allow. And this is a scary thought. That he didn't allow. Everything that happens in our lives happens because he passed first through the hands of God and gifted to us. i got to tell you, and I'll, and I'll uh, be honest with you, we've had a hard week. Um, we've been praying for my grandpa for a while. 
and uh, signs were looking good, and this week it did take a turn for the worse. And so uh, my dad called me this week and said he's probably only got a few days left. And so I sat in, uh, and I, I haven't processed it yet. I'm trying not to. Um, but I think, I think through this, I think the Lord not only knew this was going to happen, that's easy. He took this and he gave it to us for a reason. Cancer doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. It's not just an effect of the fall. It, it is. But it's not just that. God allowed it to happen, he ordained it to happen, to teach us something, and to bring my grandpa home to glory. And that's not easy to think through, but I trust in my Savior. I trust in Him. Every single step of the way, He has never, he's never left me, He's never forsaken me. He's been with me every single step of the way, guys. Never once did He say, you're on your own for the next 30 miles. I'm going to take a nap, or I need to sleep. You drive. It's not the way that it works. His, his guided presence has been with us and will be with us. His hand of protection has been and will be on us. And number three, his bountiful provision. His bountiful provision. Is it easy to find food in the wilderness? Unless you're some kind of crazy survival expert. You know what, what cactus to cut into and what, and what um, you know, uh, what berries to eat. I don't know. It's, it's hard to find food in the wilderness. How did the people of Israel survive for 40 years? Man from heaven. God gave them bread from heaven. They were hungry, and, and, and he sent the pizza delivery guy. He sent them every day. Literally, manna fell on the dew, and they were able to gather up and make bread from him. What a crazy miracle. But the Lord provided for them. And then when they wanted meat, what did the Lord do? He sent meat. And when the people were thirsty, what did he do? He sent water in the middle of the desert. Moses struck a rock and water came pouring forth. Every single step of the way God provides for. Why can't we believe that? Why can't we believe that in our lives? Why when the bills stack up do we say, how am I ever going to get through this? How am I ever going to do this? I'm under I'm underwater. I'm over my head. How, how can I do this? Why can't we trust Him? He provided for them every step of the way. It says that as they walked through the wilderness, their shoes didn't even wear out. After 40 years, their shoes didn't wear out. He provided for them. He protected them. He gave them everything that, that they needed to survive. He brought them to the place that He wanted them to be in church. He's going to do it for you. He's going to do it for you. 